All right, let's just uh, jump right in. I want you to imagine the single most high pressure situation possible. The emergency department. Exactly. A patient shows up. You have no idea what's wrong. Maybe they're actively crashing. It's just, it's total chaos. Mm -hmm. And you have seconds to go from that complete uncertainty to a definitive life-saving plan. That pivot is everything. It's really the core skill we're looking at today. We're doing a deep dive into the blueprint for that, what our source material calls the funnel of clinical reasoning. The funnel. I like that. It's a system. It's yeah. designed to take the guesswork out of it when, you know, every millisecond matters. It's really the path from that chaos to clarity. So it's a way to narrow things down, starting wide and getting more and more precise. Mm. For our listener, what are the, uh, the big phases of this funnel? There are three, and they are sequential. You really can't skip them. Phase one is universal resuscitation. Just dealing with the immediate threats. Right, the ABCs. Then phase two is the uh, intellectual part. Symptom-based deconstruction, taking that chief complaint-like chest pain and building a smart differential. And the last one. Phase three, precision diagnosis and management. That's where we use tools, scores, tech, all to turn possibility into probability and make a final plan. Okay, let's start at the top then, the widest part. Phase one, the unwavering foundation of resuscitation. The motto here seems to be, you know, deal with the now before you worry about the why. Exactly. Before we have any diagnosis, we have to buy time. And mastering the ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, that's the absolute bedrock. So let's talk airway. The first thing is anticipating you're going to have a problem before you actually have one. That's where the mnemonics come in. They're like cognitive shortcuts, yeah. you know, to stop errors from creeping in when you're under all that pressure. Right. They force a really quick risk assessment, like for predicting a difficult bag valve mask, we use the boots criteria. That's the one. Boots flags things that uh, stop you from getting a good seal or make the lungs stiff. It's beard, obese, older, toothless, and snores or stridor. And if you see a few of those, you know right away you might need help or different gear. You're already thinking two steps ahead. And it's similar if you're thinking about a superglottic device like a rescue airway. For that, we use rods. Rods. Okay, so that helps you spot things like an obstruction or, you know, weird anatomy. Precisely. It's restricted mouth opening, obstruction or obese, disrupted or distorted anatomy, and then S for stiff lung or C-spine. So if you see those factors, you're already planning for failure and moving to plan B. Instead of wasting precious time, yes. And when you have to get that definitive airway, intubation, the process needs to be almost automatic. That's the six P's of rapid sequence intubation, or RSI. It has to be a strict sequence because the second you skip a step, say preparation or pre-oxygenation, your failure rate just skyrockets. The P's are an antidote to panic. They are. You start with preparation, getting all your gear ready, then pre-oxygenation, flooding them with oxygen to buy you time. Pre-treatment is optional. Then you have positioning. And then the last two P's. This is the moment of truth. Right. Paralysis with induction, always sedative first, then the paralytic, and the final P, which is so crucial, place tube with proof. And the sources are really clear on this. The proof has to be a specific thing. It has to be continuous waveform and tidal CO2. Nothing else is good enough. Seeing the chest rise, seeing fog in the tube, that's not proof. Yeah. You need that waveform to know 100% that you're in the trachea and not the esophagus. Okay, moving on to breathing and circulation. The goal is restoring oxygen and perfusion. Respiratory failure basically breaks down into two types, right? Hypoxic and hypercarbic. Yep. Hypoxic is a gas exchange problem. Hypercarbic is a ventilation problem. They're just not breathing enough, maybe an overdose. But just like with the airway, you have to be ready for the mechanical problems. The classic one being attention pneumothorax. A classic. That patient can crash so fast. If you see the signs, the distended neck veins, the trachea pushed over, and you act fast with a needle or a finger thoracostomy, that's life-saving. You decompress the chest, and they can come right back. This systematic approach keeps going with circulation and shock. You can't just treat low blood pressure. You have to figure out why it's low. That classification is everything. The four frameworks of shock. The treatment is totally different for each one. So first, you have hypovolemic shock. Bleeding out, basically. Or severe dehydration. The goal is simple. Fill the tank. We talk about balance transfusion 1.1.1. Let's pause on that. Why is that 1.1.1 ratio, plasma, platelets, and red cells, so much better than just dumping in tons of saline? 
because saline actually makes it worse. It dilutes the patient's own clotting factors, so they just keep bleeding. It's a vicious cycle. The 1.1.1 protocol gives them back everything they're losing in the right proportion so they can actually form a clot. Okay, so you're treating the shock and the underlying problem. At the same time. Next is cardiogenic shock. The pump has failed. Maybe a big heart attack. Here, the goal is to support forward flow. You're using drugs like norepinephrine or dobutamine. Squeeze the heart and help it pump. Exactly. Then you've got distributive shock. Hmm? Think sepsis or anaphylaxis. The blood vessels are wide open. There's no resistance. So the goal is to squeeze the pipes. Right. Source control, fluids, and strong vasopressors. And the last one is obstructive shock. A big pulmonary embolism, maybe cardiac tamponade. Something is physically blocking the flow. And you have to alleviate the obstruction. Thrombolysis for the PE pericardiocentesis for the tamponade, you remove the blockage. So that structured approach stabilizes the patient. Now we can move down the funnel to phase two, symptom-based deconstruction. This is the intellectual work. This is where you have to make sure you don't miss the killers. So a patient comes in with chest pain. The very first mental filter you apply is the deadly six, and there's a great mnemonic for it, PETMAC. PETMAC, P for pulmonary embolism, E for esophageal rupture. T for tension pneumothorax, M for myocardial infarction. Aortic dissection, and C for cardiac tamponade. These are the six that represent the highest stakes, and knowing them forces you to act. If you suspect an aortic dissection, for example, your first move isn't another test. You're calling a surgeon. Immediately. Mm. You're calling vascular surgery, and you are aggressively lowering their blood pressure and heart rate with IV labetalol to stop that tear from getting worse. So the structure just forces you to prioritize. It bypasses all the low-yield stuff when there's clear and present danger. Same for cardiac tamponade. If they're unstable, you move straight to draining that fluid from around the heart. Let's take another big one, altered mental status. The list of possible causes is, I mean, it's huge. Yeah. How do you even begin to organize that? You use a four-part framework. First is D-Rudges, opiates, benzos, carbon monoxide, alcohol, you name it. Then infection. Like meningitis or just overwhelming sepsis. Right. The third category is metabolic. This is when the body systems are failing. Kidney failure, causing uremia, liver failure, a glucose crisis. And the last one is structural. A bleed in the brain, a stroke, a seizure, even just profound shock starving the brain of oxygen. And before you even run a single test, the source really emphasizes some immediate universal interventions. Absolutely. You consider the universal antidotes, sometimes called domain A, dextrose, oxygen, naloxone, and thiamine. Giving dextrose for possible hypoglycemia is fast, simple, and can literally wake someone up from a coma. It's the definition of a high-yield, low-risk move. Totally. So this gives us a list of possibilities, but a long list is still a little scary. So we move down the funnel to phase three, precision tools and probability. This is about moving from what's possible to what's probable. This is where clinical decision rules really shine. They add objective numbers to subjective complaints. The heart score for chest pain is a perfect example. Right, it takes five things. History, ECG, age, risk factors, and troponin. And assigns points to each, and that score tells you exactly what to do. A low score, zero to three, means a very low risk of a major adverse cardiac event, less than 2%. So you can feel pretty confident about sending that person home. It supports that decision, yes. But a score of four to six is moderate risk they get admitted. And seven or higher, that's high risk. They need an invasive strategy and they need it soon. The score is a gatekeeper. Another great gatekeeper is the PERC rule for ruling out a pulmonary embolism. PE is something you never want to miss, but we also don't want to overtest for it. The PRC rule is brilliant because it stops that testing spiral in low risk patients. So if your gut feeling is that it's unlikely, you can use this checklist. If your pretest probability is low, less than 15%, and the patient has a none of the eight PRC criteria, things like age under 50, heart rate under 100, no leg swelling, you can safely rule out a PE. And you avoid a CT scan with all the radiation and dye that involves. You avoid the time, the cost, the risk. It's a huge win. Beyond scores, we have technology, the digital stethoscope of our time, point of care ultrasound or POCUS. POCUS is a functional tool. It doesn't give you a final diagnosis, but it answers critical questions right now at the bedside, like the RUSH exam for a patient in shock. It's a quick survey of the whole hemodynamic system. Exactly. The pump the heart, the tank fluid status, the pipes, the aorta, and the spill any free fluid. You can do it in minutes. And what's a key finding that just changes everything? Looking at the heart, a D-shaped left ventricle. 
That tells you the right ventricle is under so much strain, probably from a massive PE, that it's physically squishing the left ventricle. That suggests obstructive shock, and you need to act now. And the EFAST exam for trauma. That's looking for blood in the belly or a collapsed lung. A key finding is the absence of lung sliding. If you don't see that shimmer on the screen, it's a very strong sign of a pneumothorax. We even use it for early pregnancy. To find a definitive intrauterine in pregnancy, or IUP. The rule of thumb is the discriminatory zone. If the pregnancy hormone BHCG is over 1500, you should be able to see an IUP on a transvaginal ultrasound. If you don't, that's a huge red flag for an ectopic pregnancy. Okay, this is how we get to clarity. Let's move to our last section, the high yield playbooks. Situations where you don't deliberate, you just act. Sepsis is the perfect example. Sepsis is an emergency where the clock is always ticking. For rapid identification, we use the QSO face score. Which is incredibly simple. It's just three things. GCS less than 15, respiratory rate of 22 or more, or a systolic blood pressure under 100. It's brilliant because it's just looking at brain, lung, and circulatory function. It's designed to flag sick patients fast. And once they're flagged, the clock starts on the hour one management bundle. Time is tissue. Within that first hour, you must start crystalloids, the 30 ml off or keodram bolus, get broad spectrum antibiotics on board, move towards source control, and if they're still hypotensive, start vasopressors like norepinephrine. No delays. Zero delays. The other big one is anaphylaxis. You have minutes, not hours. And the intervention is always the same. Always. First line, no matter what, is epinephrine, 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams IM into the big muscle of the thigh. And you repeat it every five to 10 minutes until things get better. It's the only drug that truly reverses the whole process. And the source also notes that if you do have to intubate them, ketamine is a good choice for induction. It is because it tends to support their blood pressure, which is already crashing. So we spent this whole time talking about saving lives, but sometimes the goal has to shift. The final act of care is about comfort symptom management at the end of life. And this needs to be just as structured and disciplined. When the goal shifts from cure to comfort, the chaos of resuscitation has to be replaced by the clarity of palliation. You have to intentionally stop doing things that aren't contributing to their comfort. So what are the first line plays for those common end of life symptoms? For pain and shortness of breath, it's often morphine, a small dose, one to two milligrams. For agitation, haloperidol. And for that death rattle, the secretions they can't clear, we use glycopyrrolate to dry those up. It's a structured approach to ensure a patient's final moments are managed with the same rigor as their resuscitation. This has really been a journey down that funnel of clinical reasoning. We started wide with universal resuscitation, moved the intellectual work of symptom-based deconstruction, and then narrowed it down with precision diagnosis. And the big takeaway, the fundamental truth of this work, is that the practice of emergency medicine is the mastery of uncertainty. It's not about knowing everything. It's about having a disciplined process that transforms that chaos into a clear path forward. The process is the solution. That's a really powerful thought. So for you listening, as you reflect on this, think about how these kinds of structured frameworks, PetMac, the Hour One Bundle, could apply to chaotic decisions in your own life. If you had to face your biggest, highest stakes choice right now, what's the three-step checklist you'd create to make sure you don't panic and miss something critical? Something to think about for the next time the pressure is really on? 